Thank you, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and uh, sharing some of our stories with you today. Uh, as Alan said, my name is Corey Malcolm. I am the Director of Archaeology for the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum here in Key West. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, our organization is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. And we are tasked with the mission of exploration, research, and education. And a lot of the subjects that we study uh, are subjects that don't usually make it into the front pages of the history books. We look at sort of a, a lot of the alternative history. Uh, we study the Spanish colonial period quite a bit uh, through the shipwrecks that uh, uh, we have in our museum. Uh, but also we look at the transatlantic slave trade. And there's a lot of uh, uh, transatlantic slave trade sites and resources within the greater Keys area. So uh, I, I, for Black History Month, I do want to uh, present an overview on some of the research that we're doing into the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, keep in mind as we go through this, the slave trade is just a tiny sliver of the broad spectrum of what we might term uh, black history. Um, there's certainly much more to it. Um, and as I tell these stories, um, keep in mind too that uh, um, it's kind of tough to pigeonhole them into black history. Yes, black people were involved, people of African descent involved in all of these stories, but they're much more. Uh, everybody was involved. So these stories are really all of our history. Um, and it's important to realize that as we go through and not quite try to pigeonhole them into a, a category. Category. Uh, I uh, am going to tell three stories here. I have, don't have much time, so I'm going to move quickly. First, we start with the Henrietta Marie. This is where we really got our start looking at the slave trade at the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum. The Henrietta Marie is a shipwreck. Um, it was sunk about 35 miles west-northwest of Key West on a remote reef called New Ground Reef out uh, past the Marquesas Keys. It was found in 1972 by Mel Fisher and his team as they were searching for the wreck of the Atocha. Uh, they quickly realized that the ship was English, that it was from a much later period than the Atocha, and it wasn't what they were looking for. So they made a few recoveries, took some notes, but basically moved on. But they did dub the site the English wreck. Um, and so we have a lot of notes from that time referring to this as the English wreck. In the mid-1980s, a discovery was made on the site. And that discovery was a bell. And this bell was a, uh, the big breakthrough because inscribed on the bell, it says the Henrietta Marie, 1699. And with that, the English wreck suddenly had an identity. And with that identity, we could start doing some historical research. And we found that the Henrietta Marie was sailing out of London. And it was owned by a group of businessmen. And those businessmen decided to put some of their resources into the transatlantic slave trade. And the way they did it was to follow this pattern. They would take the Henrietta Marie and sail it in what was called the triangular trade. And the triangular trade carried uh, uh, European manufactured goods down to the west coast of Africa. They would trade those manufactured goods for people. They would then carry the people across to the American colonies, sell those people uh, as enslaved laborers to the plantations, then pick up a load of New World cargoes, uh, sugar, tobacco, those sorts of things, carry them back to, in this case, London, and sell them. So uh, uh, this triangle, these three legs, were a very common route in the slave trade for about 250 years. We know the Henrietta Marie went to a place called Calabar right here in what is now Nigeria. She picked up uh, over 200 people, carried those people then to Port Royal, Jamaica, and sold them to the sugar planters there. From Port Royal, the Henrietta Marie took on a load of, of primarily sugar and was sailing back to London with this cargo of sugar and all of her profits when somehow, some way, she vanished off the face of the earth. And it wouldn't be until about 300 years later when Mel Fisher and his crew found the shipwreck that we could start putting together the story in more detail. 
Now, from the sea floor, from the archaeology, the artifacts that are recovered, we really uh, learn a lot about the slave trade. The Henrietta Marie is by far the most uh, uh, complete and diverse collection of artifacts from any slave ship anywhere in the world and really is the touchstone for understanding this business, at least as it existed in 1700. Uh, we see a lot of trade goods, things that were meant to be traded for people. We see pewter items, spoons, tankards, bottles. We see glass beads, and we see iron bars. And these iron bars are key. These were the dollar of the slave trade back then. And you could take these bars. There were uh, uh, they're about a foot and a half long and maybe two or three inches wide. You could take 12 of those bars and buy a person with them. And that is chilling to think that something so bland and basic and simple could be exchanged for a human life. But they were. We also see a large number of these shackles. These shackles were used to hold people two by two in the hold of the ship so they couldn't escape. The way they work, you put one person's ankle in one loop, another person's ankle in the other, you slid the bar through the loops, locked it through that, that hole there, and then they were two by two. And you see in this print, their ankles are all joined. So we have groups joined with these things. These are called bilbos. Uh, they were all joined by these bilbos. That kept people from uh, uh, rising up against the crew, kept people from jumping overboard, kept people uh, basically under control. We also see other artifacts from what we call the Middle Passage, which was the voyage from Africa to the colonies. Uh, we see this large copper boiler. Um, this is roughly a, a, a cubic yard. This was used to prepare food for the Africans, generally boiled rice and beans or boiled yams. Uh, we see a, a tooth extractor, um, and we see this blunderbuss. Uh, which uh, was certainly used to protect against pirates, but when we found these blunderbuss barrels, they were loaded. They were already loaded, waiting on the ship, and that was because they kept arms at the ready in case the Africans rose up against them. Uh, so these were basically riot control guns as well. So uh, this gives us a really good peek into what life was like crossing the ocean with hundreds of African captives. We see some of the ship itself on the seafloor. Uh, we have roughly 5% of the ship that has survived, but it's enough to tell us that the Henrietta Marie was a fairly small ship, and it was probably a pretty fast ship, which meant it could cross the ocean quickly and do its business in short order. Uh, tells us a lot about uh, the construction of the vessel. Uh, this is still on the seafloor. We haven't recovered it. Um, we've studied it quite a bit, and we've reburied it. Um, it's in wonderful condition, and it's still buried under the sand out of New Grout Reef. In 1993, um, a group called the National Association of Black Scuba Divers put what is a very touching memorial on the Henrietta Marie site. Uh, they, they took a concrete pyramid, put a plaque in it dedicated to uh, those people forced to sail in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and now that uh, pyramid has turned into an artificial reef with this plaque sticking out of it. Um, it's not easy to get to, but it's well worth it if you can see it. Now I'm going to tell our second story. And this we call the last slave ships. And this happened here in Key West in 1860 and actually resulted in what we recognize today as the African Cemetery at Higgs Beach. In 1860, Cuba was the world's largest sugar producer. And in order to produce all that sugar, Cuba needed a huge amount of slave labor. And they were importing at the time thousands and thousands of African people uh, to be slave laborers on their sugar plantations. Well, a lot of Americans got in on it. Um, and we have people from New York, from Charleston, from New Orleans, crossing over to Africa, acquiring African people somehow, and then selling them to the sugar plantations in Cuba. There were so many Americans doing it that our government got sick of it. And President Buchanan ordered a naval blockade of Cuba, and he encircled Cuba with Navy steamships. 
and those steamships were there to intercept American slavers. And in the spring of 1860, across a two-week period, they captured three of them, um, and uh, uh, two on the north coast and one on the south coast near the Isle of Pines. Those ships were brought to Key West, they were seized, they were brought to Key West, and with those ships came 1,432 African refugees. People that were rescued from slavery, but now something had to be done with them here in Key West. The uh, United States Marshal was put in charge of these people, and he built very quickly uh, a, a compound on the southwest corner of the island, very near uh, Fort Taylor, uh, a housing, a hospital, and a kitchen for these people to, uh, to occupy. Uh, here we see an image drawn in 1860 of that compound. Uh, here's another image. Now the Africans uh, uh, never left this compound. They stayed in there. They didn't get out and, and, and mix with the citizens of Key West. But we do have accounts because people did go down and sort of peer through the fence and watch them and they wrote about it. And so we know these people sort of bided their time. They, they uh, uh, made makeshift drums and they did their traditional drumming and dancing and, and sort of milled about and swam in the ocean and sort of killed their time until something could be figured out to do with them. And ultimately, our government decided the answer was to send these people to Liberia. So none of the Africans stayed in Key West. They didn't stay anywhere in the United States. Ships came down from New York City, carried them from Key West all the way to Liberia. That's where these people lived out the rest of their lives and where their descendants live today. Sadly, though, while they were here, we know a lot of those people were really ill when they came off the slave ship, and they never quite recovered from their, their illnesses. We had 295 of the African people die here in Key West. Uh, we have a, a receipt for their burials. We have a map from 1861 that says very clearly, African Cemetery on the south shore of the island. Well, in seeing all this material, uh, we wondered... Wow, does that cemetery still exist? We don't have an African cemetery in modern Key West. Does it still exist? And where could it be? So, we took the old map, we laid it over a modern map, and the African cemetery was right through the Martello, the West Martello Tower, and came out on the east side of the beach. And we thought, okay, let's try to find that. So we organized a ground-penetrating radar survey and peered into the, below the sand to see what was happening there. And lo and behold, right exactly where we had thought they would be, graves started appearing. Um, that that has, site has resulted in the African Cemetery Memorial. We have since done additional surveys, um, and uh, we have found many more graves. Uh, especially in the area of what's known as a little dog park today. Um, what happened is we have these original graves from 1860. In 1862, they built the Martello Tower. When they were building it, they encountered a lot of graves. We have documents describing that, and they reburied them. And so what we have is both the original graves that weren't affected by the construction of the Martello and the reburials. Uh, especially up here. Uh, this uh, uh, park is slated for redevelopment. Uh, Atlantic Boulevard is going to be moved. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we will see a unifying of the uh, uh, grave sites and hopefully some more surveying uh, where there's asphalt today. So much to come with this site, but today it is a unique uh, uh, place in the United States, and we have it here in Key West. Please go down there and look at it if you haven't been there. The third story is about a ship called the Peter Mole. And this happened in 1860 as well. And this actually came about during research into the last slave ship story. And I was going through an old newspaper looking for information about the Key West uh, events. And I came across a little article. And it talked about a slave ship wrecking in the Bahamas. And I thought, my gosh, that's fascinating. I pulled at that historical thread a little bit, and this wonderful story evolved. And we learned that this slave ship was sailing from New Orleans with a man from Key West as captain. And they had gone to the Congo River 
taken on 400 captive African people and they were sailing to Cuba. As they were sailing to Cuba, right by the Bahamas, they saw a steamship. Well, it was a mail boat. But they didn't know and they thought it was a Navy ship that was coming to get them. So they tried to go and duck behind a little island called Linyard Key and they wound up smacking right into the shore. Uh, the ship was uh, sunk right along the, the, the beachfront there. Luckily, everybody survived. They all clambered off the Peter Mole and got onto the island. Um, and wreckers came and saved them and carried them all to Nassau. Then the government uh, of the Bahamas, the colonial governor there, had to figure out what to do with them. Well, they decided, let's just make these people apprentices. And so what happened is they were basically rented out by the government to Bahamian citizens for a period of six years as apprentices. And after that, they could then blend into the community. So, for six years, these people from the Peter, rescued from the Peter Mole uh, became servants, household servants. Some went into the West India Regiment as soldiers. Some worked in the uh, salt pans, uh, raking salt. And some went into uh, uh, the agricultural business in, in uh, the Bahamas. And they did this again for six years. They lived their lives uh, doing that. For us, in our historical research, we had another big breakthrough. In an old document, we basically were given the location, the exact location of the Peter Mole. It said it wrecked in latitude 2621. Well, we know it was on Linyard Key. Linyard Key runs north and south. So with latitude 2621, we just made an X and said that wreck should be there. So I talked to our colleagues in Nassau and I said, guys, there's a, a, a wreck, and it, it might be pretty easy to find. We should make an effort. And they agreed. And so we got a team together, and once we had funding and a boat and, and uh, all of that, uh, we joined forces, team from here, team from there, uh, all got out on the boat and went to Linear Key, crossed over the island to uh, uh, the Atlantic side where the wreck should be, swam down to where the Peter Mole, our, our hypothetical X was, and lo and behold, not 200 feet away was ballast, rock ballast strewn all over the bottom, right along the shore. Um, and ballast are, are rocks that were held in the bottom of the ship to keep it bottom heavy so, so when the sails filled with wind it wouldn't tip over. Um, and these are a hallmark of an early sailing ship. So right where we predicted we have a ballast pile, that was fantastic. When we got on shore and started looking around, we started finding nails and tacks and other little artifacts. And as we worked both on shore and underwater, more artifacts appeared. Now, we don't have the rich, diverse collection that we saw uh, on the Henrietta Marie. Uh, that was buried in the sand and well-preserved. This is a very rocky shore, very dynamic, lots of waves and surf. So nothing really had a chance to preserve well. But I'm fully confident, and we all are, that we found the wreck of the Peter Mole. And with that, we can start telling the story more, more fully. And again, back to the historic documents, as we're trying to piece this story together, we had another breakthrough. And that was, in an old religious uh, uh, journal, a letter was published, written by a woman in Nassau, and she and her husband had taken in two children from the Peter Mole as apprentices into their family. And what's really wonderful for us is she gives us their names. Um, they, they were named Yambo and Cheance, but they called them Chance and Agnes. And we know their last name was Harvey. That allowed us then to go through the records and look for Chance Harvey and Agnes Harvey. And lo and behold, there they are. Birth records, death records, church baptisms, plus descendants. Um, and now, for the first time, we can trace these people from the wreck of the Peter Mole all the way down to people today. Uh, this is uh, Chance Harvey's family tree. That is the first time that has ever happened. And this is huge because too often in the slave trade, people's identities were just dis discounted. We don't know who they were. They were just listed as man, girl, boy, maybe their age, but you never knew who they were. Now, for this family, we're able to, to trace them all the way back to this point on Linyard Key and even across to the Congo River and give them a sense of who they are and where they come from. The Peter Mole is the Mayflower for this family.
the different circumstances, but no less important. And that is huge, and we're really thrilled about that. Now, we're working with our colleagues in NASA. Um, with an exhibit has opened about the Peter Mall. It's in uh, right there on Bay Street in what's called the Pompey Museum. Um, this is the old Von Du House, built in the 1760s. People were sold into slavery from this building. They were auctioned off from that building. So it's very appropriate to tell this story from there. Um, of course, we have exhibits here in our museum that tell these stories as well. Uh, uh, so uh, please uh, come come learn about them firsthand at our museum. We also tell them, we have them out on the road. We have a very large exhibit called uh, Spirits of the Passage that tells all of these stories plus more. Um, it just closed in Chicago earlier this month and opened in Pennsylvania last week, so it's out, out there um, and closer to home. Um, some of you may have seen this at the Gato building where it, it debuted. We have what's called a pop-up museum, and these are panels. There's one out in the hall to give you an example of what they are, but these pop-up museums are telling these same stories, and they're going around to schools, and they're in Monroe County, uh, up and down the Keys. They are all over the state of Florida, traveling around. So these stories are are being shared and people are learning from you know this this really huge uh, uh, system of, of transatlantic slavery that changed the, the world. Uh, so next time you come to the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum, yes, we do have silver and gold from the galleons, but we have much much more. And I hope you do, uh, will help support us and help us keep moving our mission forward. And thank you very much.